we do thank you this morning, Lord God. Thank you for, for waking us up, Lord God. You've given us another day of life, Lord. Uh, so often we take it for granted, but, but thank you, Lord. You owe us nothing, but it is your goodness, Lord. It, it is your goodness that, that has provided the breath in our lungs, Lord God, again, another day of living, even purpose for life, Lord God. We owe it all to you, and we thank you this morning that you got us here. I know that there are always strategies. I am, I am always aware that Satan and his minions are always trying to keep us from you and away from your word, not wanting us to hear your truth, Lord, but I thank you that you got us here. We overcame, Lord God, and now I pray that you would open our hearts and you would speak to us and you, you would challenge us. You would help us to learn from the lessons of the past. Again, that, that's, that's what we'll be looking at. Lessons from the past, Lord God, because we need, Lord God, to apply these things today so that we don't make the same mistakes as so many who came before us have. Be with us now. Bless our time, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning once again. If you have a Bible, which I hope you do, let's turn to the book of Jude. Book of Jude is the second to the last book in the Bible, and so I'll give you guys a few seconds to turn there. This is week three in the book of Jude. If you've been with us, you know that we covered uh, two verses the first week, two verses last week, and we covered three verses this morning. And so we are taking our time. There is so much to cover. Uh, Again, I would be doing you a disservice if I just rushed and, and, uh, and, 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 and didn't cover what I need to cover. And so we're taking our time because, again, uh, you'll see God's Word is just incredible, uh, especially in the book of Jude. And so Jude chapter 1, again, we will be picking up in verse 5 in a, in a few minutes. And so Jude chapter 1. Now, one of the most basic, and I use the word basic, one of the most fundamental truths that we hopefully already understand, we should understand, as God's children, we need to understand, is summarized in a very popular verse. I'm sure we've heard this verse many times. Hopefully we know this verse by heart, and that's this verse. Hebrews 9.27. Again, you've got to memorize this if you don't know this already. The Bible is crystal clear that it is appointed unto man to what? To die. Are we all going to die here? Is anybody getting out of here alive? No, we're all going to die. That's, again, wrap your head around that, right? It's going to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of of when. We know this stuff, okay? And the Bible is clear. And I love that God is just real with us, right? We're going to die one day. And we need to understand that. But the second thing, what does it say? After that comes, let's say it again. After that comes, okay, now I want to, I'm driving this home because I want you to understand that the Bible is crystal clear when it says that everyone, it's this man, it's mankind, every man, every woman who has ever been born dies, and after death comes, okay, and I want you to get that, I want you to think about that, because this, you need to understand this, okay, You need to understand it because we live in a day where people want to say that God is Santa Claus, right? God is this nice, old, ancient man who is too nice to judge anyone, right? He's just too loving. One day he's going to say, all right, everybody, just come on in. And he's going to let everyone into heaven. That's That's what the world says. That's what so many out there say. But from the beginning, guys, okay, get this fundamental, basic Christianity teaches us that's not the case. We're all going to stand before God. You understand that? You guys got quiet all of a sudden. We're all going to stand before God. Now, I hope you understand this. Again, it is so basic, and I'm using that word basic because you should understand this, okay? I wasn't raised in church, okay? I wasn't born a Christian. I wasn't born again and raised in the Christian church, but at 18 years old, I had already done enough wrong in my life that I knew I was guilty. I knew it. I, you didn't have to tell me. I knew, again, I didn't know Bible. I couldn't quote scripture or any of that stuff, but in my heart, I knew enough already that I was guilty before God. And unless I found the forgiveness of God, right, through Jesus Christ alone, that I would end up in hell one day. You didn't have to talk me into it, you know what I mean? I never went to a church and sat there and had the pastor give a message, and I just resisted, and I resisted, and I doubted. That never happened to me, okay? I knew. I knew that I knew that I knew I was a sinner. That was clear, okay? 
I had done enough wrong even at 18 years old, and I'm sorry to tell you, I had, but that's the truth. And I knew that judgment was coming one day. And we, all of us, again, we have to wrap our heads around this. Judgment is coming, not because I say so, but Scripture is crystal clear. Does that make sense? Okay? Now, again, we live in an interesting time. We live in a time where people maybe in the back of their heads know this, but they don't want to think about it. Okay? Which is why one of the most important things I always do, okay, when I am given the opportunity to give a funeral, I remind people, the judgment day is coming. Okay? I do. Why? Because the Bible is clear. We're all going to die, isn't it? And what a better time, right? There is no better time than at a funeral to remind people that we will all have a funeral one day. Okay? And after that comes judgment. And so we can try not to think about it, but people die around us all the time. That's just the world we live in. And we are reminded again that death is a reality. The second thing we can do, and it's interesting, I love the text because this is popular just in the last couple months, right? A movie just came out. To, I haven't seen it, but I've heard about it. I've read about it, about a preacher who for years taught the truth of Scripture, but for whatever reason, I know what the reason is, but for whatever reason, right, he believed that God gave him a new revelation that there is no hell. You hear about that? And he's teaching people. And he was eventually kicked out of his church and the church uh, collapsed because he began to teach people there is no hell. What a travesty. How terrible. What a lie this man gave. But there are many people who want to say that. If you talk to a Jehovah's Witness, they'll tell you there is no hell. They say that if you don't make it in, if you're not a Jehovah's Witness, then you just are annihilated. That's the word they use. God just causes you to cease to exist. No punishment, no nothing. You just don't exist anymore. It's a lie. That's not what Scripture teaches. Or again, you can follow the third group. The third group who doesn't know God's Word that just says, God is too nice to judge anyone, right? He's too nice. There will not be a judgment when, in fact, again, the Scripture is crystal clear that there will be, okay? That there will be. And so we have this choice, and I, and I hope you get that this morning. We have this choice either to believe God or to believe something else. Isn't that right? That's what it comes down to. Either God is telling the truth or God is lying. Have you guys ever looked at it that way? When you deny anything in God's word, understand when you doubt it, when you say, ah, I don't think so, I don't like that verse or that book or that passage, you are basically saying God has lied to us. And so we have to come to that place. Either it's all true or none of it's true. We have to get this. And again, this is basic Christianity. Now, because people, again, choose to doubt or deny or twist or change God's word, they end up believing this other stuff, right? They end up denying a judgment and they believe, end up believing these other things. And when you believe the wrong thing, what have I always said? You will do the wrong thing, right? If you believe the wrong thing, you will do the wrong thing. Now, that got me thinking. I know God's word is true. But let me ask you. All these people that doubt, all these people that deny, that twist God's word, can you imagine if God decided, you know what? I'm going to just start sending lightning bolts down on some of these people. Can you imagine? Can God do that? Can you imagine if God said, you know what, I'm tired of these atheists. I'm tired of these people who deny me these false religions and these false believers. And God just started opening up the ground and swallowing people. Can you imagine? What would happen to the Christian church if those things began to happen? We would experience a revival. Isn't that right? People would stop sinning just like that. Christians that were coming to church that were involved in sin would start repenting. Isn't that interesting? But what's so sad, follow me, what's so sad is because judgment is either a question in people's minds or a, 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 something that will happen many, 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 many years from now. You guys with me? People continue to sin. People continue to live how they want to live. Am I telling the truth this morning? 
Now, this brought me to a very famous scripture again, a very interesting scripture. One, I remember reading the scripture as a baby Christian and being blown away because this sums up the life of so many people, okay? If you've never heard the scripture, this is one you want to highlight in your Bible. In Ecclesiastes 8.11, okay, crazy verse, I love this. Solomon writes, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily. The heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Okay? That's what the verse says. Now, I, I've given at the bottom the New Living Translation. It's a lot more simpler. And that says, when a crime is not punished quickly, people feel it is safe to do wrong. Does that make sense? That's a powerful verse right there. And it explains, again, why people continue to sin. Why can people continue to do the things they know they should not do? Why? Because they're not being punished right then and there. Again, God started striking people with lightning bolts. All that would change in a heartbeat. But because, again, judgment has not happened. Because judgment day is some time away. People continue to do what they want to do. Now, you might be here and you might think to yourself, why doesn't? God just send lightning bolts down once in a while, right? Oh, man, that'll teach us a lesson in a heartbeat. But what does the scripture tell us? Why don't we see God's judgment taking place now? And the answer is real simply in 2 Peter 3.9. Peter writes that God is patient toward us. Get this, he is long-suffering. It means he suffers long. We break his heart not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Why is it that God doesn't squash us like bugs when we sin, when we're in rebellion? Because God is merciful, because God is good. It doesn't mean judgment isn't coming. He simply is postponing judgment, giving all of us a time to get right with him. Does that make sense? A time to repent. This morning, Jude, the writer of this book, is going to remind us of the past. And his whole premise in these three scriptures is to teach anyone who doubts that judgment is coming that God does judge people. Okay? You might want to believe he's Santa Claus and he's too nice, but that's not the God of the Bible. Scripture from the beginning is clear that God always judges sin, and that's what we're going to look at this morning. Now, very quickly, as then I always do, I want you to take a look at verse 3, because we're going to, I'm going to back up just a touch on last week, and then I'm going to take you right into verse 5, where we, where we pick it up. But for those of you who weren't here, you need to understand what happened, uh, so we get, you get today's message. Verse 3, he writes, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, he says, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith. Notice, and you have to have this underlined in your Bible, hopefully, once for all, and that's very crystal, right? Clear. Once and for all, delivered to the saints. Now, Jude, after he gave his brief introduction, his greeting, he went on to explain to the people he was writing to, remember, this is a general epistle, which means he was writing to all churches, all Christians in general. And he told them, he says, I was excited, right? I wanted to write to you something, just praising God for our salvation, right? We should always thank God for our salvation. God has been good to us. He says, but I found it more important, it was more necessary that I write to you to contend for the faith. Now we shared, or I shared, that the word contend is a very interesting word, and it's a picture of a boxer, an athlete, or a soldier who finds themselves in a battle, okay? And in order to overcome their enemy, or their adversary, or their competitor, they have to do everything they can. They have to expend all the effort they have to fight to stand, right? To overcome. And so it's a very interesting word. And so basically, what Jude is saying, he says, we need to contend for the faith. In other words, it's not enough for Christians just to come to church, just to sit in a pew. We need to do something. If we have been blessed and privileged to receive and to know God's word, we have a responsibility 
to stand for it, right? To defend it, to do whatever we need to do again to protect the truth of God's word. And this was necessary because why? Well, we read that in Acts chapter 20, the Apostle Paul, even before he died, he, through the Holy Spirit, had been given a prophecy and he warned the church leader. He's, he told them, after I depart, he knew his time was coming. He was going to die. He's going to be beheaded. And he warned the Christian leaders, after I'm gone, after the church leaders are gone, false teachers are going to come up out of the woodwork. And they're going to teach false doctrine. They're going to twist the truth that we have shared, that the apostles have taught, leading people astray. And just as Paul warned, again, that's what began to take place. Look at verse 4. For certain people have crept in, and here's the key word, unnoticed. You guys see that? Unnoticed. What does that mean? No one realized who they were. We would almost say they were spies. And he says, certain people have crept in. What's he talking about? Have crept in the church. People that come to church, they look like Christians, right? They sound like Christians. They speak Christianese, right? They say, hallelujah, brother. God bless you. Praise the Lord. God is good. All those staple things, right? They even proclaim to be Christians. But remember, it's not our words, but our actions that prove who we are. And these people, get this, that come into the church are actually apostates. Now, the word apostates, we talked about this last week, means defectors, okay? Defectors, people that have left the truth. And that's what they are. And understand, just as began happening in Jude's time, I hope we understand that in every church today, I'm willing to say that likely in every church in the world, there are apostates in the church. Now think about that for a second. There are apostates. An apostate, again, is someone who has defected from the truth. These are people, again, who come to church, but their minds are already made up. They already know what they know. They don't come to learn. They come to do their religious duty. But their minds are already made up. Which is why anytime they hear something from God's word that they disagree with, they just throw it out. They're not there to learn. Their minds are made up. They've already defected from the truth. They heard the truth already. And because they refused to believe it, they became apostates. Does that make sense? They refused it. They heard it and they said, I don't like that. I don't believe in that. Nuh-uh. That's not politically correct. And they chose to believe something else. They chose to believe something else, a lie as opposed to the truth. And in doing that, they became apostates. Okay? And that's so dangerous, guys. Okay? And this is the sad part again. I believe there are many people in the church that don't even know or realize that they're apostates. But there are, again, there are because we know that Scripture tells us, again, that Satan uses these people to go in, to question, to doubt the truth of God's Word, and then share those doubts with others. I, don't, I, don't, I didn't like what the pastor said. I, I disagree with that. And they're just spreading, again, their doubt. They're sowing their seeds of unbelief amongst other people. And it's especially dangerous when they do that to baby Christians, Right? brand new Christians, people searching and wanting to grow in the truth, and all of a sudden they're, 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 someone shares something that is completely false. Now, because they are so dangerous, what did Jude do? Jude began to talk about them. Notice, he says, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, and he calls them ungodly people, okay? These are not godly people. Again, they might look like Christians. No one's going to notice them. They're going to look like everybody else, but they are truly ungodly people, right? Remember, it's not our words, but our actions that prove if we're Christian or not. The word Christian means 
like Christ, right? If we're like God or ungodly. And he gave us two ways we can identify them. Look at number one. He says, who pervert the grace of God into sensuality, okay? Number one, and we touched on this last week, those that are apostates, you can typically identify them because they pervert or they take advantage of the grace of God to cover their sensuality, okay? How many of us have met Christians who think that the grace of God gives them a license to continue to sin? What do they do? They know better, but instead of repenting of their sin, what do they do? They say, well, God understands. Well, God knows my heart, right? They're, they're shacking up, or they're sleeping with their boyfriend or their girlfriend, and, and their excuse is not get right because it's a sin and it's breaking God's heart, but their justification is, well, God understands. God knows I'm lonely. And they're changing God's word. They're denying again that God always judges sin. And so anyone, again, who is taking advantage of the grace of God, again, for their notice, sensuality, that's a sign. Something's wrong with them. Something is wrong with their heart. And Jude says, you're going to notice that. Notice that. We talked about this last week. That false teacher on TV with the last name Duplantis, right? What is he doing? He acts like a godly man. He acts like a godly teacher. And what's he telling his congregation? I need millions of dollars donated so I can buy my fourth jet. You guys hear about that one, right? Is he living for himself or is he living for God? It's all about himself. It's all about satisfying his flesh. And it's a sign. He's false. He is an apostate. The second thing, quickly, is notice you'll always identify a false believer because they deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. How do we know, again, Jehovah's Witnesses, right? Uh, Mormons, again, you, the list goes on, right? Muslim, all, all the way down. How do we know they are all false? How do we all know they are wrong? Because they deny who Jesus is. They deny they say, oh, he's an angel, or oh, he's the half-brother of Satan, oh, he's a small God or a little God, that's what they say. Oh, he's a great teacher, oh, he's this, oh, he's that. They make him anything less than who he truly is, right? Which is the Son of God and God the Son. Anyone who denies that he is, notice the word only. He's the only one, the only way, guys. Anyone who denies that, that he is the Lord of all, is an apostate, Okay? And we have to mark these things because, again, they are dangerous. They're dangerous in the church. They're dangerous, again, especially to baby Christians. Now, as we pick it up here in verse 5, right? Remember what Jude said in verse 4. He said, who long ago were designated for condemnation. You guys see that? Jude has already told us that these apostates, unless they repent, are going to be condemned. Does that make sense? They are going to face judgment. And now he's going to tell us why we know that. Okay? Because the past shows us. This morning, it is a warning to apostates. Okay? From the past. We can look at the past and see what God has done. And because God doesn't change, we know it still applies to us today. Amen? Amen? If you're taking notes this morning, three examples of God's judgment from the past, okay? Three examples of God's judgment from the past, with the first one being that the Jews are destroyed for not believing God's word, okay? The Jews were destroyed for not believing God's word. Verse 5, he writes, he says, now I want to remind you, okay? Real simple. No, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it. Now, I love this because that's really simple. Jude says, look, guys, let me, let me remind you of something, something that you already know. Okay, I know you know this already. That's what he's saying. And I love that because oftentimes, again, when I'm up here, I understand this is what I'm doing, right? Most of you have, who have been around a long time, you guys know this stuff. You guys know these stories. Hopefully, you know these stories. I would venture to say, hopefully, majority of you do know these stories. But my job is to remind you. 
to remind you of these stories. And that's exactly what Jude is doing. Remember, he is writing to the churches in general. Jude knew every church would take his letter and they would bring it before the congregation and they would read the letter to the congregation. And get this, he knew that as he's going to give these next three examples, that they already knew these stories, right? They're Jews. They know the stories. They know their history, right? They know what happened. And I love this because that's what he says. You guys know this stuff. Now remember, every church is filled with true believers and apostates. Does that make sense? Every church, I'll say it again, is filled with true believers and apostates. We don't know which is which. Okay, we don't. But get this, both groups are exposed to the word of God, right? If they go to a Bible-teaching, Bible-believing church, both groups hear the Word of God, hopefully week after week after week. And so they know this stuff. And so Jude writes, I'm going to remind you guys of something. And he knows, again, he's going to be addressing both groups. Now, what I love about this, he's going to give us these examples, and these examples are going to serve two purposes. One they are going to be a warning to those in the church that are apostates. You better hear what I'm telling you is what Jude's saying. You better repent. You better get right before it's too late. That's the first point he's trying to do. And the second thing is it's a warning to believers, right? You better make sure you stay on the right path. You better make sure you stay with the truth and don't deviate don't follow the examples from the past, again, which is what he's going to give us next. Now, as we go through this, again, it's only three verses. We are going to touch on three very important, interesting stories from the Old Testament. We're going to move fast. Why? Because Jude moves fast. He doesn't give a Bible study on each of these examples. Why? Well, he just told us. Because we know this stuff already. Does that make sense? We already know this stuff. Hopefully we know this stuff. And so he's just going to touch on it, just as I am going to touch on it. My hope, again, week after week, is that I remind you, okay, to apply what you've learned in the past to your present day situation, right, for the sake of your future. Does that make sense? And I think that's really important. We need, on a weekly basis, right, on a daily basis, to read God's word, to look back at the scriptures, to be reminded of what God did, because God doesn't change, and allow the past to impact our present, which then will impact our future. Amen? This is what it's about. You might be here and say, why are you reminding me? Because that's what we need. We have short memories, okay? And we need to be reminded. And so he begins with the first example, and he reminds them that, notice, Jesus, right, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. You guys see that? The Lord Jesus, right? He saved a people out of the land of Egypt, but also afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Now let me ask you quickly, do we know that story? Do we know this story? How many of you watch the Ten Commandments every Easter? Right? Right? We know this story. We know the story. Hopefully we know this story. Hopefully you remember that the Jews were in bondage. They were slaves in Egypt for over 400 years. Do we know that story? And they cried out to God, okay? They cried out to God for mercy. They cried out to God for deliverance from Pharaoh's bondage. And God in his goodness, God in his mercy, what did he do? God heard their cry, amen? God delivered these people, and I love this. First, God smote the Egyptians, didn't he? Through the ten plagues of Egypt. Then, God saved the Israelites after the Exodus through the Red Sea. We know that story? Drowning Pharaoh's army, right? Beautiful. Then, God led them to Mount Sinai. And God, from the mountain, spoke to the children of Israel, right? Very beautiful. Again, we know this. That's where the Ten Commandments came from. We know the story. 
Now, if you know the rest of the story, what happened next? And this is what the verse talked about. After Mount Sinai, God led his people, right, through Moses to the city of Kadesh Barnea. And you need to know this city, okay? K-A-D-E-S-H, Barnea, Barn-E-A, okay? Real simple. It's a very important city. Now, this city was important. Why? Because this city was on the border of the promised land. You guys get the picture? It's on the border of the promised land. And I love this. It's a beautiful picture. Now, God gave Moses a promise that Moses communicated, right, to the Israelites. And it said this in Numbers 13, 1 and 2. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, send men to spy out the land of Canaan. Notice this, which I am giving to the people of Israel. Was it clear that God was giving them the land? Okay, real simple. From each tribe of their fathers, you shall send one man, every one a chief among them. Okay, and so Moses did as God directed, send out 12 spies into the promised land. Okay, for 40 days, very important, 40 days they spied out the land. And they seen a land flowing with milk and honey, okay? Beautiful land. Again, I tell anyone today, you will not believe how beautiful Israel is until you go there. It's greener than green, okay? It's beautiful. I'm a big banana eater. And they got bananas in Israel. I'm like, what's going on? I mean, they have everything over there. Seriously, incredible. They come back, and what happened? Ten of the twelve spies were discouraged, and they came back with a bad report. We know the story? And they told the rest of the children of Israel, this is what they told them in Numbers 13, 31, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. They discouraged the people. Now remember, God told them, I'm giving you the land. It's yours. All you got to do is just follow me. Just obey me. I'm going to give it to you. But they didn't want to believe that. Instead of taking God at his word, they began to give in to doubt. And they discouraged everyone. They discouraged everyone. They said the Canaanites are like giants. They're big guys. They make us Jews look like grasshoppers. That's what they said. And then we read this. Well, you read this next. Numbers 14, 1 through 4. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation, everybody, said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt. Why did we even leave? That's what they said. Oh, what, or oh would that we had uh, died in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become prey. Would it not be better for us to, what does he say? Go back to Egypt. Okay? And they said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Okay? So sad. Again, so, so sad. They were brought to that place just like all of us are brought to that place. To take God at his word. To trust God, right? To trust God. And we have to decide whether we believe God told us the truth or whether God lied. That's what happened. This was the place that they were. And instead of taking God at his word, they chose to give in to unbelief. Okay? They chose to doubt God. They chose to say, I don't know if God's word was true. And what were the consequences? Well, the consequences is for each one of those 40 days that they spied out the land, right? God said, you wicked and unbelieving people, right? For each of those 40 days that the spies spied out the land, you will spend one year lost in the wilderness. One year. Remember, the only ones that got in of the 12 spies were Joshua and Caleb, Right? Everyone, get this, everyone that was 20 years and above. Think about that. Is that everyone in this room almost, 20 years and above? God says you're responsible. You're responsible for your own actions. Very important. All of them died in the wilderness. 
Every one of them. Not one of those. This is important, guys. Not one of those who doubted God's word made it into the promised land. Does that, does that make sense? They all died. Now, their children got in, but none of them got in. This was their punishment. This is what happens when you doubt God's word, when you question God's word, when you give in to unbelief. Now, what's incredible about this is, get this, weren't these the people of God? Weren't these the Jews? If God did this to the Jews, is there anyone that's exempt? What's the point? No. You could say, well, I'm a Christian. Oh, I've been raised in church my whole life. My, my dad's a pastor. You can say whatever you want. It doesn't matter. If you doubt God's word, you will be destroyed. Is that my word? Look back at verse 5. What did he say? Look what he says. Afterward, God destroyed them, those who did not believe. And this is the lesson. This is the lesson. They were destroyed. Now, it's incredible. I, again, I, I almost wish I would have just spent the whole time on this one story. But here's what's crazy. I want you to think about this. This, this, this will blow your mind if you don't got it already. God brought them all the way to the border. Does that make sense? To the border. God did that. He delivered them from the world, right? Egypt. Brought them all the way to the border. All they had to do was to exercise faith and walk in. Isn't that incredible? Real simple. But they refused to believe God. The word faith it means trust. They refused true trust God. Now remember, they had seen God's mighty works in the Red Sea, right? They seen God's mighty works through the ten plagues of Egypt. They heard God's voice, right, rumbling on Mount Sinai. They seen the smoke and the fire. We get all that stuff. And yet they still gave in to unbelief. Now that blows me away. Because I've met so many people who have experienced God, right? They've tasted the goodness of God. God has done miracles in their life, right? People that had life in prison that God set free. I mean, so many examples. People that, again, should not have, you know, conquered the addiction of heroin or opiates or whatever it is and are free and then go on to doubt God. People that prayed for their loved ones to be healed, pray for their own deliverance from cancer. And what do you know? God heals them. And then six months later, think to themselves, oh, well, it was the doctors. It was the medicine. Yeah, God used the doctors and the medicine. But they forget and they begin to doubt. They begin to doubt. Think about this. Think about this picture. They were at the border. They were at the border. Do you understand? This is so sad. Do you understand? I truly believe that there are millions of people in hell today that were at the border of heaven. They were at the border of heaven. But they gave in to doubt. They gave in to unbelief. And they never made it in. Does that make sense? They were right there. God brought them. I think about the church. I think about our church. I think about you guys. Believe it or not, I think about you guys a lot. And I see your faces as I'm praying. And I think about some of our young kids. And I think about how many of them, again, are right there. And they give in to doubt. And I wonder how many, again, in our own church, I'm just being as real as I can with you guys, are going to go from the pew to hell. People in hell today that were in church every Sunday morning. That's, the, that's real, guys. That is as real as it gets. And that's the lesson. We better not give in to unbelief. We better, again, be careful about questioning and doubting and calling God a liar because there are consequences. Does that make sense? There's consequences. Let's go one last verse and then we'll move on. Turn your Bibles, hold your place there to Hebrews 3. It's a couple books back. Hebrews chapter 3. Because the writer of Hebrews, some say it's Paul, we don't know, talks about this event, okay? Talks about this. And he gives us a warning. The same thing that Jude is doing and we need to pay attention. Hold your place in Jude. Go back a couple verses again. To Hebrews chapter 3. And we'll look at verse 12. We'll look at verse 12. 
The writer of Hebrews writes this. Take care. What does that mean? Be careful. Okay? Brothers. Is he talking to the church? I want you to understand this. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil. And what does he say? Unbelieving heart. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to people that are going to church. He's telling them, you guys better be careful, right? You better check yourself that you have an unbelieving heart. Notice, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another, right? Encourage one another. Remind one another that this is true, that God's word is true, that it does not change. Notice, remind another every day. Do we need to remind ourselves that God's word is true every day? Yes. Notice, as long as it is called today, as long as we have today, guys, let us remind ourselves that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Oh, sin will lie to us, guys. Sin will deceive us. For we have come to share in Christ. If, there's the if, we hold our original confidence firm till the end. What did Jesus say, right? He who endures to the end will be saved, right? We prove we are saved by enduring to the end. And that's what this, the writer of Hebrews says. We're going to prove again that we were in Christ if we hold on to our original confidence, what we believed from the beginning. Notice, as it is said today, if you hear his voice, right? If you're in church, if you're driving on and you hear the radio, if someone shares with you the truth of God's word, what does he say? Today, if you hear his voice, he says, do not harden your hearts, right? Don't harden them. Don't turn your heart from God. Don't allow your heart to be so hard like a rock that the scripture can't penetrate, that you give in to doubt, that it just ricochets off you. Notice, as in the rebellion. You see those words? What's he talking about? He's saying, don't be like the Jews who hardened their heart and robbed themselves of the promised land. Keep reading verse 16. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt, led by Moses, and with whom he was provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? God said that. You're not getting in. But to those who are disobedient. Notice. So we see that they were unable to enter. Why? Because of their unbelief. Because of their unbelief. Again, I could have given you many more scriptures. But the truth is, God calls us to believe him. God's word is true. God has proven his word over and over and over again. But if we allow ourselves, allow the deceitfulness of sin, right? To doubt God, to question his word, to say it's not politically correct today, to do whatever we do again, where we just say, ah, I don't want to believe that. I don't believe that or whatever it is. We have done the same exact thing as the children of Israel. And if we have, we need to understand that we too will be destroyed. Does that make sense? I got quiet. I have to stop here. I have to stop here. Again, I'm looking at the time. I, I, I got another half hour. And so I'm going to stop here. We will do part two next week. Uh, I encourage you to read the next two verses. Again, you can do it in like two seconds. But read the next two verses, and we'll get into the next two examples. Either, either that or I just rush, and I know you don't want me to rush because we get into some amazing stuff next week. And so we'll end here. Let's pray, guys. Let's pray. Again, Lord, we, we love you. We thank you. Thank you for the truth. Lord God, I, I, I want to follow your lead, Lord God. It's not my agenda. It's not what I plan. It's what you want, Lord. And I thank you, Lord God, that you speak, that it's your word that goes forth, Lord God, that you teach us lessons. 
We know your word doesn't change. You didn't make any mistakes the first time. There is no need for correction. You are perfect, God. Remind us, Lord God, that we need to follow your lead. You are God. Lord, you make the rules. And we thank you, Lord, that you've given us your truth. Thank you that we have it. We don't have to wonder or question or or, or try to figure it out ourselves. All we have to do, Lord God, is take the time to read your word, to believe it and receive it. And in doing that, we will honor you, Lord God. We will honor you, Lord God. We will show you that we trust you, that we believe you. The Bible says, Lord, your word says, without faith it's impossible to please you. And so we please you by trusting in you. Lord, we love you. We thank you this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.